it's Jane here. Yes, I'm up at the plot, but this is about all you'll see of it today <laughs> because this last weekend I went and visited a local plant hunters fair just a few miles away. Now, I recently put up in the Facebook group, um, I asked people which flower shows they were going to this year, which big gardening shows they're going to. And over here in the UK, we have things like the uh, Royal Horticultural Society, but on huge shows each year, you know, I'm sure we've all heard of the Chelsea, Chelsea Flower Show, wherever we are. Um, but also to put down flower shows in the States, etc., etc. But what is very often overlooked are the smaller, more local fairs where you have people turning up who have more often than not grown the plants themselves and are an absolute wealth of knowledge and they are more than happy to pass that on. So I couldn't resist meeting up with John Cullen from John Cullen Gardens, all his details are going to be down below, about how and why he gardens but more importantly why he thinks pollinators are such an integral part of our gardening methods today. Right, okay, I'm here today on a gorgeous April day at Sugnall Walled Garden. We can sort of see in the distance here, it's the um, Handwinter's Fair. And I've come specifically today to meet John, here, from John Cullen? John Cullen Gardens. John Cullen Gardens. And John won't mind me saying this at all, but he is actually an award-winning horticulturist. Thank you. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that, John? Yes, yeah, so uh, we started our nursery probably uh, about 10 years ago, and we had quite a quick rapid succession growing up through the ranks, but we've uh, got as high as silver gilts at the RHS shows, always chasing the gold. Um, we've done Chelsea as well, and uh, we're back at Chelsea next year, actually, so we'll be there in oh, 2023. Wow. Okay, so how's your confidence? Uh, better than it was the last time because we got five weeks notice the last time. Oh wow! So we got in on a cancellation. Okay. So this okay. time I've got something like about twenty-five months to but prepare. That, so is that better or worse? Though? Better. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so it doesn't better. prolong the agony. No. 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 Okay. It does make you change your mind about five times. Oh, but that's of course, fine. Of so, course yeah. it does. And what is it that you show? What is it that you? So we specialise in Achilles yeah. and plants for the pollinators. Yeah. Uh, so anything that's going to bring in either the bees or the butterflies to the garden and we hold the national collection of Achillea mellifolium. Whereabouts is that? In the South Lincolnshire, so okay. we're just between Boston and Stoldham. Okay, so is this, you, you have a nursery there? Yeah. Okay, is it somewhere people can visit? Or they can it? visit, yeah. yeah. We have open days and then they can book an appointment to come in. Okay. That sounds very posh, but it's just because we're always out and about doing yeah, things, well, like, things this, like this. Yeah, well things like this, so you get yourself around about the plant exactly. and the and things yeah. like this. So, yeah. so people can always catch up with you. I will put John's details below so you'll be able to sort of catch up with all his media. Um, so do take a look down there. But it's what you said, what interested me about talking to you today, John, was talking about pollinators. Yeah, see, I was, I was very lucky. My dad was an engineer. Right. And he didn't trust anything that came in a bottle oh. that was manufactured by someone like Shell or hmm. ICI, okay. who basically did a lot of the pesticides and herbicides for plants. Yeah. yeah. Because the way that he looked at it was if it was a chemical, and he was, a he was big on growing things to eat. Right, okay. So he didn't want to spray something on what he was going to eat, mm -hmm. because then he worked out that was going to eventually yeah. end up in his stomach. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I was brought up uh, very much with things like garlic washes, mm. So garlic wash all the plants rather than put chemicals onto them. Yeah. And then also putting other things in to sort of ward off so you do your companion planting yeah. so that you then don't get the same sort of nasty stuff. So, so you were very, very privileged then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not asking yeah. you how old you are, John, yeah. but I think... <laughs> He was ahead Maybe of his time. Maybe ahead of his time. He was I mean, I suppose time. organic yeah. gardening. Yeah. You know, that, that he didn't dig either, so he had a no dig policy. Which is what we're trying yeah. to adopt. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, like I say, I'm wondering in your business now whether you have seen more of a shift towards Massive. the organic. Yeah, in Massive the last few years. Massive shift, yeah. Or since you started. I would say, I mean, obviously, the last couple of years we've not been out and about as much mm. because of COVID regulations. Mm. But prior to that, so 2019, um, we tend to find that at a lot of the shows we attract younger. Mm. 
no, growers that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they buy into the fact that things are organic Hello. we don't you know we can't call ourselves organic because the soil that we work on has to be untreated for 10 years right okay. we've only been there for seven years now okay. um, so but we use organic methods yeah and I think a lot of people sort of you know down from the sort of 45 and downwards mm. are really buy into all of that that's mm. the, you know they're educated in that yeah um, yeah whereas if you're maybe trying to sell that to somebody that's maybe in their 60s or 70s it's, it's kind of shot down and flames a little bit because so they've been brought up they've been hardwired really i know so obviously we bought a plot of land that wasn't farmed on in lincolnshire yeah. our properties there as well uh -huh. but the whole place was laid to lawn yeah we've put th th in excess of thousands of plants in because we planted up the whole front mm. we put a lot of trees in and the amount of bird life that we have because there's more for the birds now because they can come into the garden they can find things to eat um, we did this crazy thing and people will think I'm a bit mad that you can train the birds to come and get the snails oh. so what you have to do well, that could make you a fortune John <laughs> what you have to do is you have to pick out any of the snails and you put them in a spot where the snails can't dis escape from which normally means you have to throw them by water it. okay so what we did is we put them into a, a big trough and you put sort of bricks onto it and then you put a saucer at the top and we always used to put slugs and snails in there. And the birds then get used to the fact that they're always there okay. and once they get used to the fact that they're always there they then start looking around the garden. Now we get woken up in the morning with the blackbirds when they find the snails yeah. banging the snails off our roof of course, at half past yeah. four in the morning. Yeah, yeah, so it's <laughs> coming back to haunt you. But at least it's it noise you go, oh, well, okay, it's working. Isn't so, that incredible? Yeah. But if you go onto the website, you can actually filter out by which pollinator you want. Do you want a long tongue bee? Do you want a short tongue bee? Do you want a butterfly? Do you want a moth? And people will say, well, what's the difference between the tongues? Well, long tongue bees are things like your bumblebees. Okay. They'll hover, so they've got a really long tongue that they can push inside the flower and drink up all the goodness. Oh, right. Flowers such as? Such as oh, uh, foxgloves, lupins, okay. all those so sort of things, yeah. that have got, like the bell-shaped flowers. Okay. Um, Achilles, which is what we specialise in, um, are more attracted to honeybees and butterflies. Because short the short tongue, ah. they can land on the flower, so they want something a bit like a launching pad, so they can get onto it, they can sit on it, and then they can drink all the way around it. And if you look at an Achillea flower, it's made up of, because it's part of the Aster, it's Asteracea family, which is a huge family is, um, with, of all sort of daisy flowers. But most people will say, how can it be a daisy flower? But if you look at an Achillea, the flat head is made up of about a thousand tiny yeah. little flowers yeah. that are all little daisies. Yeah. So yeah. when the bee lands or the butterfly lands on that, it can sit there and rather than having to move around, it can just sit. And work its way around it. A so banquet. They're a bit lazy, basically. Yeah, they don't yeah, want to yeah, move around. Yeah, 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 but that's how to get them in, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and another thing we say to people as well is that if you if you want to attract the pollinators in and you're buying sort of five or six or something or you're you're doing lavender or anything like that, do it in blocks. Mm. Because again, if you've got it in a big block, the pollinators will come in and they'll drink away. Oh, Whereas yeah. if you've dotted all those things around your garden, they've got to go from one side right to over to there to the other. Budley yeah. is a classic one. People yeah. will buy four or five Budleys. Yeah. They'll put one in each corner of the garden. That's a long way for a bee. Yeah, no, you pop know. them all together and then yeah. they'll come in and then what you'll get, we have, we've got a whole strip down the one side of the nursery, it's all Budley, and the other side it's all ornamental cherries. And when I go into the nursery when it's butterfly season, literally, they all just come flying out. Fantastic. Because they've got this one area that they yeah. can feed in. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing that we think about when people think about pollinators, they think about putting particular plants in. And more often than not, they're plants that are going to be flowering midsummer. Yeah. So the bees, the butterflies, the moths, they're, all, they're, they're fine midsummer. Yeah. But what about extending that Sending period? That season. So we quite often see bees in the nursery now as early as February. Uh, mm. um, Plants such as hellebores are going to be in full flower at that time, mm -hmm. and the bees love them. Mm -hmm. And you want to also think about um, so you've got your hellebores, your pulmonarias, lots of spring flowering abricia plants, and all of those plants that flower really early in the season, you will notice, are low level. 
Yeah. And there's a reason for that. Because okay. the beams yeah. don't have a lot of energy. Oh, so they don't want to get up that high. We don't want to get up into sort of like something that's two metres like high Like your buddleia. Yeah, like yeah. Your buddleia. They that's haven't got why the they're not flowering oh, right now. Right, okay. So it's a lot of... So what you can do if you've got, say, trees planted, especially deciduous trees, think about planting underneath them. So okay. underplant them with things that were maybe going to come into flower when your trees are not going to be doing anything. Okay. So your things like your pulmonarias, your abricias, your hellebores are all great for that sort of okay. thing. Okay. The um, spring anemones as well, and blanda is a great one. Okay. And the bees love it. What about bulbs? Because we bulbs, tend to think of bulbs yeah, as absolutely. spring. Absolutely. So bulbs, you know. bulbs, things like your daffodils, your hyacinths are all great ones. Mm -hmm. The only problem with a lot of the daffodils is you want to watch and try and get ones that are single rather than the doubles. The double ones they don't like. I've learned that. We do grow quite a lot of the double ones, but then that's for scent. Yes. So we do like yeah. to have a lot of scent in the nursery as well. Um, muscari is yeah. a great one. So your grape hyacinths. Yeah. The bees just goes adore mad. that. Yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. you know, if you get you get the ones that are not too invasive. Yeah. You know, they can they'll make a nice drift as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, the hardy cyclamen, cyclamen cum. Of course. Amazing. Mm. Great leaf. So it looks nice. Yeah. And then you've got the flowers that the bees will go into yeah. as well. Yeah. How do we keep those bees going? So generally, we want to have something flowering in the in the nursery, so sort of around about November time. Mm. The Achilles go to about October, mm -hmm. but then you want to think about with any of your perennials, especially ones that are, if they're early flowering, could you extend that season? Mm -hmm. So okay. you could either do the Chelsea Chop, mm -hmm. you could yeah. do the Hampton Hack, yeah, yeah. or the yeah. Tatton Trim. <laughs> Depending which part of the country you're in, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. and depending on uh, when those flower, when those plants would normally stop flowering. So Achilles, for example, normally they'd stop flowering maybe about September time. So you don't want to give them the Chelsea Chop because they're just coming up. Yeah, yeah. So you'd give them either the Hampton Hack or the Tatton Trim. So you take them back, okay, and then they'll reflush again, sort of September, October, and you'll get another six to eight weeks so. out of that. Shrubs as well. Okay. There's quite a few flowering shrubs around at that yeah, time yeah. of the year that yeah. will you know, kind of extend that season too. So why Achillea? Uh, why, so could you have chosen anything? We what could have, We could have chosen anything. Achillea's, we've, we, before we started the nursery, we used to do a lot of garden design. Mm -hmm. And I used to use Achillea's in garden design mm -hmm. because they're tough. Yeah. Okay. They are drought tolerant. So once you've got them established, you don't have to do anything with them. That's a win as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're a plant where you can go away on holiday and you come back. Mm -hmm. The plant looks great, you look great. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's a win-win there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can use them as dry flowers. You, some of the varieties you can use in teas as well. So they're, in a sense, edible. Ooh. Um, as I say, they dry really well. You can use them as a cut flower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what I like about them is when you get them on mass, it's like a melding pot all the way through because they just all intertwine with each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got one area in the nursery which is just for the Achilles, yeah. which is probably like a two yeah. metre by six we metre bed. And we've, we've put a few other things in there so that there's something when the Achilles are not in flower. But when they're up and that whole bed is just full, yeah. it's great. And you get yeah. such a wide range of colours. So they start in whites, they go yeah. to yellows, then to oranges, pinks, reds and no, sort of like clarets, okay. no blues and no okay. purples. Okay, so but if you're into blue and purple... Between, yeah, yeah, blue and purple, then you're going to have to get a salvia or mega pan yeah. yeah, but but you love them. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And is it those that you... Those are what we show at the big shows, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so if you do go along to one of the big shows and see John, take a good look at the Achillea. I think, um, I think I'm convinced I might give one or two a try. I've tried Sweet Cecily. Yeah. Is that part it's of the same part family? It's part of the Achillea family, yeah. Cow but parsley? It, yes. Cow parsley, same, similar. Yarrow. Similar, yeah, yarrow, yeah. Okay, but not tansy. Uh, tansy is also part of the Achillea family as well. Right, oh, yeah. okay. Tansy, no problem. Yeah. As whenever I've bought an Achillea plant, yeah. I've never had any look with it, yeah. but I'm going to give it another go, John, because yeah. Good they free just sound like a soil. Mm -hmm. uh, They can be planted in clay, because I say we used to use them okay. a lot in London and they were fine. Super hardy? So they're super hardy. Mm -hmm. uh, drought tolerant, obviously, as well. Okay. But um, they don't like to have anything above them, and that's quite often right, the biggest okay. mistake that people okay. make. Whenever you plant an Achillea, look up. Yeah. If there's something above it, it's not going to like that no. and it'll start doing things like that. All right. They're really greedy for the light. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you want them in a really nice open spot. Okay. Sounds great. And of course, if anybody wants to have a Achillea grown by a prize winning horticulturist, you can go to your website Absolutely. and shop. Definitely. <laughs> but I'm going to have a little look around now. Maybe you can lend me one or two to take Definitely. away with me today. But thank you very much, John. Not at all. It's Pleasure. Been really good.
what do you think? What a lovely man. And what I like about these small affairs, I was talking about the large affairs before, and obviously the people who produce plants for those fairs are a wealth of knowledge unto themselves, but very often the, the places are so busy that you don't tend to be able to sit and have a really good chin wag with them. So to be able to have such a good chat with John was lovely. And, you know, he's speaking not for just from how he practices today, but how he's learned that basically since being a child and, you know, and his love of gardening has now developed into a fantastic business for him. So I'm, I can't go there. I'm not going to keep going on because I talked enough during the interview. It was supposed to be him talking and you know what I'm like, but I couldn't leave <laughs> without buying one of his beautiful Achilles. And if I show you, this is the other thing about plant hunters fairs. He took me around and showed me the best one he thought for me, which is, let's see if you can pick that up. Achillea, Achillea Lilac Beauty and just look at how healthy that is. I mean that, he said I could divide that into two plants but if you wanted to you could probably divide it into more but he told me that's been outside all winter. Now bear in mind it's only just the beginning of April. How healthy is that? Plus look at the roots. I mean it's not root bound it's ready to go in the ground but it's been absolutely so well looked after so yeah i can't recommend them enough i was going to um do a video of me splitting i was going to call it tansy same family apparently of me splitting the achillea but actually if you go over to john's website there's a wonderful video of him showing you how to propagate um achillea and i'm not sure if there's one or two other flowers as well but do go over and take a look and say hello but i got that and one of my other favorite plants that I used to have one, I used to have a red one um, that I lost in a garden somewhere many years ago, is a uh, monada, which is bergamot. And this is buzz pink frosting and it's meant to be quite a vibrant pink. So that is gonna be fun. And again, I won't bring this up to the camera, but that is such a healthy plant. So I would really, really advise you looking up plant fairs that are local to you. It doesn't mean that all the exhibitors are going to be local to you. John came from Lincolnshire, which is quite a fair distance away. Um, but yeah, you'll find the most friendly, supportive people there to chat to. So <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Do check out the links for John below and I'll see you again very soon. Bye for now.